one of those things. I was offered a book and uh, it necessitated me going back and rereading a lot of the title just to see if I could do it, if I had any ideas. And it turns out I didn't, so I turned it down. <laughs> so it was like two weeks just wasting my time, basically. Um, Did you enjoy yeah. what you were reading, though? Um, no, not really. Like, no. once it's for work, it's kind of hard to... Uh, it's kind of hard to enjoy comics because you're reading it looking for ideas. Right. So you're always stopping. Like I, I find it with anything now, like as soon as I started doing more uh, writing, I, I, I can't watch movies or TV shows without kind of dissecting it mm -hmm. and like, pulling things from it and figuring out why things work and why things don't work. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I, I, it's uh, it's my, my cross to bear. <laughs> It's so sad, so tragic. Seems heavy. Yeah, I, I reread all these comics and I just kept thinking like, oh man, like nothing's grabbing me. And I remember originally reading them and, and really loving them. And then on the reread, I'm just like, shit, like, like, I don't know if these are that good or, or they're just not my type of good. Yeah. Like, they, they felt like there wasn't a lot of characterization and uh, um, it was all really big stuff happening, um, which kind of turns me off a little bit in comics when the writer's just like, oh, or you think them fighting Galactus or something, now they're going to punch God. Like, all right, sure. <laughs> sure. They just have to go bigger every yeah. time. Yeah, it's like when somebody says like, oh my God, that thing costs a billion dollars. You're like, wow, that's a lot of money. You're like, oh wait, no, I meant a trillion dollars. And you're like, wow, that's a lot of money. But you have no concept of either of those things. So it's like, basically I think above a million dollars for me, I'm just like, what? That's a crazy amount of money yeah yeah it's like yeah a thousand dollars is a lot of money to me <laughs> yeah yeah exactly it's like what uh well uh i guess would there be any comics right now that you'd recommend to anybody like i guess comics aren't currently coming out but like in an overall like maybe newish comics would you have any suggestions um hmm that's a tricky one um I've, I've, I've recently been recommending people um, reread uh, Anna Senti and John Romita Jr.'s Daredevil run if they have a chance. I know it's not a new book, but um, but it's it's so much fun and so interesting. And uh, what she does with the character is um, is weirdly ignored, um, probably just for general misogynistic reasons. But like um, everything she did on that title was so groundbreaking. And uh, I, I always want to draw as much attention to it as possible. Um, yeah, that, that's kind of the, the thing in the past that uh, that kind of brings me joy. Um, currently, I, I, got, I actually had to turn and look at my shelf. You know, I was suggesting a lot of Lisa Hanawalt recently, um, just because she's insanely funny, and uh, and you know, people need a laugh right now. Yes, that's what I got up there. <laughs> Yeah, a lot of my books that I love are really downers, so I don't know if I'd suggest them. Uh, we actually love love being sad here. <laughs> yeah, it's actually my favorite thing. We are uh, <laughs> one of our most liked uh, photos on Instagram is actually of us crying, <laughs> Se separate occasions, but still crying. Yeah, it's more like a, a like, like, oh, I'm sorry, and uh, this is how I acknowledge that you're crying. Is that? Oh, because I took it as like <laughs> they're crying. <laughs> yeah, I kind of took it as that. I enjoy them crying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, sure. Yeah, I mean, we all have different <laughs> types of friends. Um, yeah, well, there, there's one book I was recommending um, last year, which was uh, Guy Delisle's Hostage, which is just a wild book based on uh, uh, real life events. Like Guy Delisle wrote like um, kind of travelogue comics, um, uh, Jerusalem. Uh, which is also an amazing book. And this is the first one I think he did where he interviewed somebody for it. Um, so it's a nonfiction book about someone's experience uh, being a hostage in a, in a Eastern European conflict. Interesting. And so, and so the whole book, it's like 400 pages or something, it's giant. Um, the whole book is basically from that guy's point of view. And uh, it's kind of, I, I suggest it because it's the, it's, I don't think you can do it with any other medium. Like if you did it as a novel, um, 
it, it would just be too uh, mind-numbingly boring. Uh, if you did it as a film, you couldn't get across the feeling of um, that length of time. But because of the way it's structured, it's like, you know, panel to panel. It's just like, what do I do today? You know, this day 30, like, how do I, there, there'll be small little bits of uh, hope and, you know, yeah. try things and things won't work. And like, but because it, it's, it's structured very tightly and uh, is so dense, um, it really gives you a feeling of anxiety and tension as you go through it um, to determine whether or not this gets resolved <laughs> well. Like, you know it does because it's being told to guide the Leo. But, uh, but it, it's, it's one of the only times I've kind of wished that I um, was reading it uh, on a Kindle or an iPad um, so I didn't know how much longer it was in the book. Yeah. <laughs> so to, to know part like paid off. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. So I, I really enjoyed that just because of the, uh, the fact that it could only be done as a comic, I think. And who was that by again? Uh, Guy DeLille. Okay. I think it's drawn in quarterly. Yeah. Okay. Just actually just a second. <laughs> Forgot to record the whole beginning of that. Oh, well. Yeah, this is it. Yeah, yeah. Guy did okay. the oh. message. Yeah, and it is, it is drawn in quarterly, and you know, it's a very, it's a very simple book, but like, like super evocative. It's just you know, hey, yeah, that's that's the view, right? And I love the like the muted colors of it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So when something does like pop, like outside, um, it really pops. Like it's just like um, it's a shock. So yeah, that, uh, that's one of my all-time favorites. I love it. Heather, you speak. Okay, I will do it. Um, I don't even know which one to ask. <laughs> you can, you can see which it. ones are mine versus which ones are yours. <laughs> okay, so um, what have you been doing? Uh, I guess we kind of already asked that, to stay busy during the pandemic. Okay, what are your top five pandemic meals? <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah. Um, so uh, my wife, I always want to say like Borat, my wife. I, um, oh my God, my husband does that to me every time I see him. <laughs> I, I've never done it to her because I know she'd hate it. <laughs> yeah, this is it's... Just for, this is for you and I. Um, <laughs> like she, she's obviously working from home as well, and um, but her job is more important than mine. Uh, uh, she works for a nonprofit where she develops curriculums for uh, Canadian classrooms on um, how to teach kids uh, how to spot misinformation and disinformation. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, that's really cool. And it, it's, it's, it's super important. And also it's a thing that I don't think a lot of parents recognize that is needed because they think that kids instinctually know how to use the internet because the parents like, you know, they're like, look at these digital natives. They can touch an iPad. Like, yeah, you can touch an iPad and you know how to navigate that but you don't actually know how to navigate the internet and information. Uh, so it, it's not taught in schools. Like it's, it's such a weird thing. Like you kind of, you kind of think like the internet should be a course just oh, yeah. to, help, <laughs> help, to help kids navigate stuff. And so this is kind of like that. Um, and so obviously with the pandemic, um, they've got a whole new subject matter to, you know, teach kids how to, you know, fact check things online. So her job's super, super busy right now. So uh, uh, the meal making um, has fallen squarely to me for the most part because I'm just banging my head against the wall trying to figure out <laughs> comics. Um, uh, so yeah, uh, I, I, I made, it might be a good choice or a bad choice um, pre-pandemic, but February I decided to go vegan. And it's because my, my little brother went vegan a year or two ago and he was like, he was like a, a hefty boy with knee problems. And so he, um, he didn't want them to have to operate on his knee. So he had to lose weight in order to like walk basically. And he, he went vegan uh, with no actual ethical compunction. He has no ethical reason for anything as far as I can tell. <laughs> uh -huh. But, uh, but he really took to it and it, within a few months, it kind of like the ethical part kind of clicked in and he started to think about food consumption and, um, and yeah, he started working out and he's just like, he's in amazing shape and 
uh, I kind of wanted to do it in support of him. And uh, I had a trip in New Zealand where um, we were at this kind of Airbnb, which was like a farm that had like these two alpacas on it named George and Daisy. And I fell in love with them. It was just like adorable. Yeah, alpacas. I love alpacas. Yeah. So much. <laughs> I, I've never actually been like close enough to like pet one and like They're see great. how inquisitive they are. Um, and yeah, there's something kind of hit me like, cause especially driving through the New Zealand uh, landscape, like it's all like sheep and cattle and, um, and then these alpacas and uh, I don't know, something about it just kind of hit me. And I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to try to stop eating and um, using these creatures. <laughs> and uh, yeah. So when I came back, I, I, you know, declared I'm going vegan, which is, which is also a funny switch because my wife is a long time, a lifelong vegetarian. And I was the meat eater, which she looked at as a monster. And then now I get to look at her as a monster for eating eggs. Which <laughs> is very, very fun. <laughs> I didn't realize how much I'd enjoy that part of being a vegan. Um, but I really do. The power. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's the power. And so, um, so yeah, so I started doing this before all this came down. And uh, I found it incredibly hard. Like when we go out to eat, like sometimes you go to a restaurant and I'd be like, um, I'm just conditioned to not um, put up a fuss. Like if I, normally if I was in a restaurant and a waiter brought me the wrong meal, I'd be like, well, it's food. And I'd just eat it. Like I wouldn't even tell oh, them. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. But now I'm like, I would have to like point a thing on the vegan uh, menu and go, I'm sorry, is this, is this vegan? And like, like my soul would die even just saying it like I, I'm now I'm this customer um so we go to places where there'd just be like nothing for me to eat or I'd just eat like an appetizer of like french fries and I'm like okay I'll eat when I get home so when the pandemic hit it like weirdly made it a lot easier because we just could only eat at home mm-hmm. um so my I think my favorite meals are um just kind of roasted broccoli and rice and tofu marinated um it's it's so simple it's, it's so good um i like i like to make t- uh tomato sauces so like just a bunch of really great tomatoes and um uh let it stew for a while uh, I, I introduced my wife to because she grew up like kind of like hippie-ish like uh she'd never really had processed foods before and uh, i introduced her to just like old el paso like hard taco shells <laughs> As a kid, I loved like taco night. Taco night was like this huge thing in our house. And so that's like, that's one of our main meals too. Just like some veggie ground round and, and the taco kit. And it's just, oh, it's so good. It's so I good. can uh, give you my taco recipe. It's top notch, but it'll burn your mouth off. Yeah, Brayden ate it last night. Sure. And, like cried because there were so many jalapenos. It's like all jalapenos. <laughs> and I'm getting better with that. Like I used to be really um, kind of anti-spice. Uh, and I guess I started watching the Hot Wings show. Oh God, I love that show. It's so good, <laughs> it's but so also good. it tricks you into thinking like, yeah, I could do that. I yeah, do that. I think that every single time and then I eat a jalapeno and cry for three days. <laughs> so I don't yeah. know if I would be able to, but I'm going to pretend. I, I feel like I'm building my tolerance um, because there's also a thing in the back of my head that says, you know, you're like a, you're like a C-level comic book celebrity. Maybe one day... Uh, Maybe one day you'll be on the show. Like, no, of course I'm not. Well, we can send in all the letters. We'll make it happen. Yeah, yeah I was yeah, going to sure. say, I feel like we can just nominate you and they'll have to put you on. Yeah, yeah, that's how it works. Yeah. Um, Isn't it not? I, yeah, maybe. We'll never but, know. Yeah, it's a mystery. But yeah, I, I watch that show so much and I just trick myself into thinking I can do it. And so I've, I've been building my tolerance to spice just naturally. Like... I've been adding more like chipotle sauce and jalapenos to things just to be like, yeah, I can do this. I can do this. And so far, so good. So far, so good. Do you want to get into the meats? Well, he's vegan, I told you so. I'm vegan. <laughs> do you want to get into the tofu part of this? <laughs> yeah, the, tofu the protein. Part. <laughs> I will say, first of all, just so you don't catch me later, I've given myself six months of being vegan. So maybe the next time we talk, I'll just be taking huge bites out of the sides of cows. I have no idea. Only eating meat. <laughs> Only eating meat. <laughs> well, my Not mom from is one that. end to the other. My mom is that. Like she's on like some 
Cato thing or whatever, where all she eats is meat constantly. And I don't, so like, I don't make sense. That sounds bad for your insides. It does sound bad for your insides. And she's like, she feels great. She looks great. And like, but like when she goes to like my brother's house, who's again been vegan for like a year and a half or whatever, she brings like a Tupperware full of meat because like she's got to cook meat there. He just like, I guess, waits outside while she does it. So oh really gosh. messed up family dynamic right now. <laughs> all the time mm -hmm. all right so we'll get to the meat of it okay so is this the meat this is the meat this is the bones okay so i guess who are you like most influenced by like whether you know writing or artist um art is super hard to say because uh i i feel like it's always more um somebody else's thing to be like oh look at you got a real dan Klaus vibe to you and i i won't i won't notice it because it's not a conscious thing you just kind of draw how you draw right um i'm sure there are some artists that like look at another artist and go "Ooh, i like the way they do that do like hats or whatever and then kind of copy their way of doing hats um but don't really i don't really have that uh yeah so i, th I feel like other people would be better at answering that question um maybe maybe with like it's funny, there, there are certain things that I pick up from artists. Like, you know, I mentioned the John Romita Jr. Uh, Daredevil stuff earlier. And like, heads, I would always try and design them like him. Like, they'd be kind of blocky heads because it helped me kind of figure out the shape. Um, so there'd be like weird little elements like that that I'd pick up. Kevin McGuire, like I would, I would definitely pick up like facial gestures from, uh, from his stuff. Um, but yeah, it's like an overall thing. I, I can't, I can't think of anyone in particular. I don't know. Do, I'll ask you, like, who do you think are my? Uh... I don't even know. Yeah. Because I kind of like pinpoint something where I'm like, oh yeah, I'm just not good with names. Yeah. <laughs> or people. <laughs> wow. I don't know how that bold, is. bold statement. I mean. <laughs> Uh, I mean, plus I feel like you kind of have like your own sort of style, especially when it comes to art. Yeah, I mean, that's always the hope. Um, it's funny, there was, there was a guy uh, named Mike who did uh, a book called Mikenesses a few years ago, which where he drew himself in the style of every comic artist. I made a, a, he's an amazing mimic, this guy. Like he, 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 he nailed uh, so many styles. I just kept thinking as I'd see them, I'm like, what would mine look like? Like I can't, I, I don't even see my stuff as being a style. So it would be hard for me to actually picture someone drawing like me. Uh, yeah, it's a weird thing. It's a weird thing, your style. Uh, writing is, um, all, all I can ever th think of is just like who the writers were that I read uh in my formative years so like like Anna Senti was definitely one of them um Jam de Matisse and Keith Giffen their run on Justice League I think really influenced me the idea of kind of uh weaving humor through a superhero story um yeah those are those are kind of the big ones uh yeah Walt Simonson actually for art as well like the design of Walt Simonson stuff was always mind-blowing to me uh, yeah Cool. 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 You, you can talk you now. Can. <laughs> <laughs> this is how this goes. It's more yeah. of a like, we don't know what to do. Whose turn? <laughs> Whose turn? Your turn? Your turn? We didn't script this out. <laughs> do we look like professionals? <laughs> we just <laughs> panic ate a bunch of food and then came over here. So yeah. I checked yeah. a beer, so that's fine. Yeah. Great, great. With <laughs> courage, sure. <laughs> Uh, I guess, how do you like prepare yourself to either like write or draw a story? Um, well, I mean, like the, the, the first step is research. Like, like I was saying about that title earlier. Um, uh, I, I know there's a lot of comic writers who have notebooks of ideas for characters and stories that maybe they'll do one day, but I don't really have that. Like I kind of treat each job as, as like a fresh clean slate. Like I don't bring like 
my idea of what Spider-Man would have done when I was eight years old to it. Like I want to look at it now and kind of figure it out. Yeah. Um, so, so really it starts with a lot of research uh, where I, I reread um, kind of the main runs on a title to get a better feel for it and try and generate ideas. Um, yeah. At that point it's like, it's a lot of long walks and thinking and, and sketching things out. Like it kind of helps that I'm an artist as well. So I can like, Sometimes you have a scene in your head and you just kind of, you need to kind of sketch it to get a feel for it. And that can sometimes dictate the story. Uh, yeah. Like I, Daredevil is an example. Like I went back and reread a lot of, of the, the main classic runs on that title and, and really thought about the implications of violence and um, what I wanted to tell uh, as a story. Because it's, it's not just about the plot, it's about, you know, what are the themes? Like, what are you actually trying to say to the reader? Uh, you know, I, I often read comics that are just like, plot, 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 like, and this happens, and this is cool, and this happens, and this is cool. I'm like, okay, but what, what are we learning from it? Like, wh what, what are the questions that the reader has about the ethics of the situation? Or, um, you know, what's, what's, an, what's the actual emotional arc for a character? And so, so that's kind of at the forefront is thinking about what the, what that emotional arc is, um, especially on a title like Daredevil. Um, you know, all these characters have been through a lot, so you have to kind of find a new way to kind of um, break a character down and, and build them back up. So, yeah, so I, I kind of, I conceive generally what the story is, and then I kind of work on how it's going to look as kind of story arcs. Uh, once I have that, then I can break it down into individual issues and um, you get a better feel for it at that point. You know, I, I, I kind of pitch it usually at that stage when I know how it's going to look for like 20 issues or something. But I, I try and leave it open for change because um, there, there's an instance in Daredevil where uh, like this is the unfortunate part of working for uh, Marvel is that um, the schedule so demanding they have multiple artists working on a title, mm -hmm. which means I have to write issue 14 before I write issue 10 sometimes just to get an artist started. So th with things out of order, your plan has to be relatively tight. Um, but I remember, yeah, there's one issue where I end up just killing a character off. I'm just like, Oh no, this character has to die to, to really advance the story. But there's another artist that had already drawn the character four issues later <laughs> so we had to go in and like figure out a way to like change that character into someone else like i don't know like, <laughs> that on them. Um, so that's 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 a really tricky part um but yeah like once once i have it kind of broken out into issues it becomes a lot easier to, to sit down and write um the trick really is just kind of not um closing yourself off to possibilities because um sometimes the characters surprise you while you're writing them and the choices that they're going to make. And you're like, okay, well, um, that'll change the story. So I have to accommodate that somehow. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 How did you get into comics? <laughs> <clears throat> well, I'm glad you waited to like the halfway point. It really hit me with the, uh, <laughs> the heavy duty. I need, you know, the deep stuff here. I need everything. We tried to put our questions in some sort of order, but once again, we're wild cards, so it doesn't yeah, matter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're throwing me off kilter with your gotcha journalism. Um, uh, I mean, I got into them as a reader fairly young. Um, I have, you know, they're the Archie comics for sure when I was a kid, and uh, uh, I remember the animated Spider-Man TV show, and then there was this one day where... Uh, I remember being in a drugstore and I think I had like, you know, a buck or two that I was allowed to spend on comics. I'm like, Oh, cool. And I went to the comic rack and usually I just kind of bought the jug heads or whatever. And, uh, but I saw a comic that had like all the superheroes on it. And it was like, it just seemed so important. And it was this one here. It was, uh, I just happened to have it right beside me. <laughs> Issue seven. You knew it was Marvel coming. Marvel Superheroes Secret Wars. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and it was just wild. Like, you know, at the time, I was just like, this is the biggest thing that has ever happened, ever. Uh, it's every superhero in its life or death, and they're fighting every bad guy on a planet. And when you're, you know, seven or eight, uh, it just, it really does blow your mind. 
you know, I found out years later that the comic was created to um, to bolster a toy line that Marvel had a deal with Mattel to put out. And uh, my favorite part of that is that the name Secret Wars came about because uh, Mattel like uh, focus tested a bunch of words on little boys and and the two favorite words were secret and war. <laughs> and that's how be. Secret Wars happened. <laughs> Uh, amazing uh, but at the time hey it, it totally worked it got me hooked on the comics and so i i became you know quite a devout uh, marvel reader i convinced my little brother to be a dc reader um that way i could read dc comics as well without buying them and at some point i convinced them that they're worth so much money that i should look after them <laughs> it's real that's the ultimate dick older brother move I mean, uh, I did that stuff to my little sister too, but with like action figures. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, they're very valuable. <laughs> hmm. That's what got me into them. Um, in terms of like creating them, uh, I didn't actually anticipate creating them. Like I, I liked drawing comics as a kid and I went to school for art, but um, it was pretty clear at, at the art school I went to that comics were not an option. Um, the teachers and faculty looked down on comics and there were a bunch of us that you know wanted to do them but uh, we we focused on editorial illustration so i i didn't i just kind of did my own after school um you know kind of self-printed zine style and did shows and um and yeah i ended up working for a uh, newspaper and doing comics for them and uh, had a, like an advice column i became a bit of a columnist and 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 just did dumb comics on the side uh, basically up until Sex Criminals, which was just kind of a lark between um, Fraction and myself. And next thing I knew, I had a career in comics. It was weird. <laughs> that was actually like, you just combined like several of our questions yes. right into one. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you came more prepared than we did. <laughs> uh, is there like a favorite aspect of your work that you have? Um like a like a favorite part of the activity of making comics or i feel like that was your question i just asked it oh um yes <laughs> <laughs> like what do you enjoy most about like writing the story for instance i guess like probably the best part is getting the art back um seeing the the, the wildly talented creators um taking your words and turning them into something um, that never gets old. Like you really do kind of feel a bit like a God. <laughs> like, <laughs> like I just type a thing like, you know, Batman drives down Gotham street and yeah, there's a street called Gotham street in Gotham. <laughs> <laughs> and Gotham. And then like, yeah. and then like, you know, a week later or whatever pages start coming in and someone has drawn the Batmobile going down the street and every window in a building and people jumping out of the way and Batman hitting the Joker with his car. I don't know. Um, and it's just, it's so cool. It's such a cool part of the job. Uh, yeah, that, that part never gets old. Like I, I like writing. I like the moments in writing where you, where it feels good, where you're just like, Oh yeah, no, this is hitting. Cause like, I can feel it myself. Um, it doesn't happen that often. Sometimes you write a thing, you're like, geez, I hope this works. Um, but once in a while you, you write a thing, you're like, oh, this really works. Um, and if the art comes in and matches it, like hits that vibe, that's the best feeling. If it doesn't hit the vibe, it's the worst feeling. <laughs> like, uh, like when a page comes in, you're like, oh no, like this is supposed to be a big moment and now it's not. And that's, and you have to rewrite, you have to like dig your way out of it, which is, uh, which is hard. But I can't even fault the artist because like, it's such a hard job. Like uh, there's so few people in the industry that like just nail it in one go. Um, that have the instinct for it. You know, I, I often talk about my time um, writing Star-Lord, which was like only six issues really. Um, but uh, the art team on that was Chris Anka and Matt Wilson and just the platonic ideal of comic artists. Oh yeah, yeah every, sure. every, day, every day I'd wake up to a new page from Chris, like like clockwork like he was just amazing with deadlines and every page was perfect and i was like oh there's no notes i got no notes like the storytelling is great the anatomy is fantastic 
Um, and then Matt Wilson would just make it look so much better. Um, which is why we ended up doing white trees together. Like I told him at the time, I'm like, I will literally do anything with you guys, like anything, any character, anywhere. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's a great feeling. That's actually, that's yeah. our favorite uh, yeah. group of creators working on stuff. So oh, really? oh, yeah. That's awesome. yeah. Yeah. No white trees was honestly one of the best comics I've read in a long time. And like one of the best like fantasy books I've read in a long time, just because you did such a great job of like doing a fantasy book and two issues in such a way where you were like attached to the characters and in, like involved and invested where like, I don't, I haven't felt like that in like two issues ever. Oh yeah. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Devastated. The, uh, I mean. Yeah, you ruined feelings, but it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> it's my job. Yeah. That, the, I mean, the book came about, um, Chris wanted to draw hunky dads and he wanted to draw a fantasy setting. I'm like, great. Like I'm into all of that. Um, but I, I wasn't a big fantasy fan. Like, uh, I don't know. I watched game of Thrones. That's really the extent of my fantasy. Like I scoffed at the Lord of the Rings books when I was a kid. I, my ex-wife loved David Eddings and I would mock her by reading passages out loud. Um, <laughs> which is why she's my ex-wife now. But, um, but, but again, like, it was the characters. Like, I wanted to make the characters feel very real and grounded. Um, and the world building, I wanted to be where you just kind of get a taste of it, just enough to kind of put you into this, into the setting and uh, into a fantasy world. Because I also knew that Chris and Matt would elevate that. Like, they would um, make it feel like a real thing, even if we were just kind of doling out tiny bits of the history of the place and what the rules are in that world. Um, and I, I loved it. It was such a great challenge because uh, it happened because Chris uh, basically said to me, he's like, I've got three months between projects. Can you get me a script by Christmas? And it was like, I don't know, mid December. <laughs> I was like, yeah, yeah, of course. Um, and I started thinking of formats. I'm like, okay, well, we could do it in two pages, 30 pages each. And I remember just writing. It was the first time I ever actually had, was able to sit down and write a full story um, ever because Marvel, the stories don't really end, you know? Like, you just kind of keep going, keep going until someone else takes over the title. But with this, it was like you could really sink your teeth into it and um, to have the 60 pages to, to, to explore everything uh, was such a treat and... And Chris and Matt just knocked it out of the park. Um, it, we're we're going to do more. Um, you know, this isn't the official announcement, but like, um, we kind of you don't. We're going to hold you to this right now. No, we, we ended up in the same situation again, where Chris was like, "Hey, like, I got some time. Um, can you get me something?" I'm like, "Yeah, I can." And so I did. Um, the, the shape of it is changing a little bit from the the previous story. Um, Chris right now is working on Spider-Verse 2. It's like his day job. Um, but he's, he's drawn like 20 pages of this new thing and um, he's, he's jumping right into it as soon as he's done with uh, Spider-Verse. So there's definitely going to be another chapter to it. And uh, all I can say is that it picks up directly where the first one left off. That's yeah. so exciting. Yeah, no, that's, <laughs> that's like the coolest thing I've heard all day. That's, that's almost like his, more his, exciting his, than this interview. <laughs> his, 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 his new designs and the new characters that are introduced are just like, they're so gorgeous. Like uh, Chris can do no wrong. He, he once again put a challenge to me of what he wanted to draw. I'm like, all right, let's do it. Oh, this is exciting. It's super, it's super fun. Yeah, I get, I get really excited when I see uh, their work on anything. I mean, that book turned out, it just looks so beautiful. Yeah. Like just the colors and the art combined were just. Ugh. Yeah. And like part of working in comics too is finding people who are great people to work with. Like not just professional, but like you, I genuinely love those guys. Like, um, and uh, it, it makes working on a project so much easier, you know? 
Yeah, because you have to have like a relationship with the yeah. person that you're trying to build the story with, at least a semblance of one anyway, and it helps to get along with them. And Yeah, yeah, them. especially uh, as the writer, you have to anticipate what they want as well um, and um, not be too hard on them, <laughs> like in terms of what the, what the script is asking. Um, my, my, my scripts are usually filled with a lot of apologies, like when I do hit a point where I'm like, and it's a opening shot of the city bustling. And I'm always like, I'm sorry. I'll make sure the next five pages, there's nothing like that. <laughs> and, you know, yeah, uh -huh. yeah, they're great. Mm. You've already uh, gotten through a lot of these. Yeah, <laughs> you're really good at answering questions. <laughs> yeah, I'm a pro. <laughs> um, so for your art, what do you use for like your drawing or your inking and coloring and stuff? Um, when, uh, when I was starting on Sex Criminals, I kind of recognized that uh, I was too slow with my traditional process to produce the book on time. And so I made the switch to digital. Uh, so I have uh, Cintiq. Angle around here, maybe. No, I can give you the corner of it. <laughs> it's beautiful. It's so good. <laughs> uh, it's a it's a bunch of years old now. It's probably eight years old, I guess, since we started. Um, uh, yeah, so I, I just I I draw right on there. Uh, I do my layouts in Photoshop just because it's the quickest, easiest way, and uh, and then I do my pages in uh, Clip Studio, which is also known as Manga Studio, which is a comic making program. It's fantastic. It changed the way I worked 100%. Uh, with, after that, I color everything in Photoshop. Uh, and I do all the signs and weird graphic bits in the background of Sex Criminals. I do them in Adobe Illustrator. Uh, a lot of it is repurposed from my days of the newspaper. The advice column I did, um, I structured it every week. So it was like an airline manual. So like... It was, the, the column was called Extremely Bad Advice. So a reader would write in and I would do it in four steps always, giving bad advice, in which each one would have an accompanying illustration with like arrows of like people doing things, um, very clinical style. But I amassed a huge library of images as a result because I did it for like five years or something. And so whenever you see a background poster in Sex Criminals, in that kind of weird style. That's, it's almost exactly from that newspaper gig. I'm gonna have to um, start paying attention to that. <laughs> just, just slightly tweaked. Um, and so, yeah, so then I letter the whole book in, uh, an, in Illustrator as well. And, uh, and then lay it all out in InDesign. So it's like, it's four programs, I guess, um, that I used to make a comic. I mean, obviously I'm a stupid man and, um, having decided to do every <laughs> every part of sex criminals besides the writing uh means i have to use a bunch of programs to get it done but yeah yeah it's worth it i guess do you find it um more i guess satisfying to do it that way rather than like traditional just for the end result or which do you prefer it's a better end result like it's a much cleaner look and uh, it's much easier to do perspective because of the tools. Um, and if you screw up, it's easy to undo. <laughs> um, it, it, but it's not as satisfying as traditional. Like if you like, like inking a page traditionally, um, really nailing that is such a great feeling and getting some really nice brush strokes uh, um, can really bring a lot to a page. Like every once in a while I toy with the idea of, you know, I'm doing a, a project right now that I'm drawing and, you know, it's a, it's a corporate character and I'm just like, oh man, like if I did it traditionally, I could like actually make some money. <laughs> like I could sell the pages. So I was toying with the idea of like doing it digitally, then printing it out and then inking over top of that. I'm just like, oh, I don't, there's just no time. That's <laughs> um, I get my kind of traditional thrills, uh, uh, at conventions doing uh, sketches for people like like that's really kind of saved my sanity in terms of creating art because uh, I, I do a thing at shows where it's like a $20 sketch for a character of my choice $30 for their choice and it's just headshots and I get to do it with like 
ink and brush and some water so I can do some gray tones. And I can do them quickly. I can do them like within five and 10 minutes. Um, but it's just so satisfying, like just kind of like shaping it on, on, the, on the page, knowing like you can't correct it. Uh, and, and, and people like seeing someone create art in front of them too. Like it's, there's a bit of a magic quality to it um, that I've experienced as well, watching you know, better artists than me do the same thing. Uh, so yeah, that really helps kind of fill that void for sure. Why is the restaurant next door so loud? You know? <laughs> They're not socially distancing. They're not. They're not. Well, I mean, we're from Nebraska and we never shut down. And, nope. <laughs> and then now restaurants and shit are open. Yeah. Uh, have there been a lot of cases or... We result? are actually number one in the country right now. Yeah, hey. we are, yeah, we're peaking right now because our governor is just awful. <laughs> yep, it's bad so, yeah. governor. We'll yeah. kill a lot of people. Yeah. It goes. It's been great. It's been great. It's been super fun. Uh, no anxiety, you know, about the whole situation. <laughs> <laughs> I it's can't go anywhere. <laughs> it's trapped in a comic shop for for the rest weeks. of our lives. Yeah. This is actually my first time back for like a month and a half. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I took a little time off, so. Yeah. Smart. <laughs> and then I was like, I gotta live here forever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Champ's just been here the whole time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I guess you kind of answered that, like, but would you prefer to draw or do you prefer to write? Or like when you get that opportunity to do both, is that like the Mecca, I guess? Um. Or is that just a pain in the ass? Uh, drawing, so on sex criminals, uh, it's so laborious. Like it takes so long to draw and color and letter a page um, that it's really hard to justify sometimes like being that focused on one project. Um, but, but there's a greater feeling of satisfaction when you finish a page. Like when I finish the script, I'm like, oh, I finished the script, send it off. When I finish a page, I'm like, oh yeah, like there are parts of this at work. This is great. Like it, it, it has a real feel of finish, um, which I, I, I like. Also, um, while people pay attention to the art in a comic, uh, it's not like the art changes drastically from issue to issue. So like feedback on it is always the same, which is good, frankly. Like. Cause Matt bears the brunt of like people being upset uh, about story reasons, uh, which, which I experience as well, obviously powerful because everyone has an affinity for a character and they have their ideas of what the character should or shouldn't do. Uh, and, and so that, that can be a little hard to take, but if I was just drawing a book, like you either like my art or you don't like my art. Like you're not gonna be like last issue you drew great. And this issue your drawing sucks. What's up? Like that just never happens to anyone. Like maybe over a year, someone will like grow to like your work or your work will slowly get better or change into a different style. But um, the criticism of, of artwork uh, is, is missing, which can kind of be a blessing. So I, I, I like that part of working on sex criminals. Just like being, being the person in the process that can deliver the, the jokes and like the, the, the colors and like the characters that you've uh, grown to love while also it's not my fault if Matt makes him do something you don't like. <laughs> like it's great, it's a good feeling. Um, uh, writing is satisfying on a different level. Like uh, I do love getting the reactions from people when you've planted a mystery or you've, uh, or you know you're gonna deliver a thing that's gonna make them like laugh or cry and, and it works. like. Like there's, there's no better feeling. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, and, and writing is quicker. Like I can write a script in three or four days, which, uh, <laughs> which makes you feel a lot more productive. Right. Than drawing a comic, uh, for sure. Uh, writing and drawing it together, there's like an added element of pressure because it's all on you if it fails. Like on an issue of Daredevil, if my story doesn't hold up, like Marco's art, people will still love it you know <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> um but like you know I, I there's not a lot of chances for me to write and draw my own thing like I did an issue of spider-man last year two years ago that should made me cry well, yeah well I'm sorry 
but also that makes me very happy. Uh, <laughs> no, it hit like I've never read an issue of Spider Man like where I've just been like, damn, that hurt my feelings a little bit in like the perfect way. It was also just like I love wholesome shit. Yeah, yeah, I try to deliver the wholesome <laughs> shit. Thank you. But with that one, I was uh, like, I almost never get nervous about anything. Um, there's something wrong with my brain. But uh, with that one, I was a little nervous with it coming out because I'm like, well, this whole thing lives or dies on me. Like other people would just be like, oh, this is overdone melodrama and it looks like shit and you suck. Or they'll, they'll, they'll like it, right? And so there's, there's more pressure when you're doing everything on a book. Um, because really it's up to you if it, it uh, lives or dies. It, but when I'm just writing or just drawing a book, like there's a million excuses that I can use for when something doesn't work. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, I wanted to ask this one. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, claiming, claiming yeah, questions. Um, I've been eyeing this one the whole time. So uh, what is your favorite sex position to draw? Uh, anything that's under the covers. <laughs> it's so much easier. <laughs> um, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. There's, there's advantages to all of them. Um, like, so, so part of the process with sex criminals is uh, my friends come and act it out for me. Seems legit. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> the, the first time they met was for the issue one photo shoot, uh, in which you know I invited these uh, these two friends of mine who'd never met to my studio in my backyard <laughs> garage, and I plied them with some booze and some uh, Indian takeout, and then I took out my digital camera and I was like, "All right, so we're gonna uh, we're gonna take some pictures," and the, I did it uh chronologically so the first um scene in sex criminals is basically the main characters having sex on a sink like a countertop and so like i basically introduced them and then my friend tippy sat on the on my desk and my friend alex just kind of started grinding into her just like kind of looking elsewhere because like what's going on i'm just like taking pictures like a fucking pervert <laughs> um uh, uh and we've we've done it ever since like almost every issue we they, they come over and like now we're all great friends like um because they've experienced this with me as well because at the time we didn't think it was going to be anything and and uh you know my friend tiffy who portrays uh, Susie, like she'd walk into a comic shop and like her husband or her husband would point her out like she's in sex criminals she's in sex criminals and then like she'd get this weird little fan moment and like <laughs> Um, my friend Alex, who portrays John, like he works in a comic shop, so like I think he gets it a fair amount as well. And it's kind of it's fun having them come along on this ride. But when it comes to shooting the sex positions, like it's gotten more comfortable as we've grown to love <laughs> each other more. But you know, I would have this fold-out couch in my studio, and we'd hit those scenes, and I'm like, all right, like you'll be on top of him, or he'll be behind you, and. Um, uh, the ones that are easiest to take the photos of without them laughing or uh, being wildly uncomfortable, those are my favorite ones to draw because they, <laughs> they feel more naturalistic. Right. Uh, yeah, but but legit, like undercovers is like, mm -hmm. like if I can just <laughs> do, draw their faces on some sheets, like it's amazing. Once I get to the legs, like everything kind of falls apart, also because of their height difference. You know, which, you know, I picked him because I thought that was going to be fun and funny because he's like six, five or something. And she's like five foot, like they're that's, wildly the, that's me and my boyfriend. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, wild. <laughs> yeah. And like, you know, it, uh, it makes for interesting um, positions and, uh, and some things work better than others, but some things just look wrong. And like, uh, like I said, especially when it, it gets to the legs, it just feels like this giant and so whenever I can kind of like crop out the legs and just make it upper torsos, then the, uh, the ratio is a little bit closer. But once you get his legs in, they just keep on going, right? <laughs> it's hard to, hard to keep them in frame. There were a few, there was like also, I really enjoyed, um, there was an early issue where we talk about John's sexual history uh, with guys. And so I, I made my friend Alex pose with me for those ones. 
and uh, he just could not keep a straight face. Like, I'm fine. I've, I've kissed dudes. I've, I was in college. I get it. Um, so it was fine for me, but I don't think he'd never had that experience. So he'd be, he'd be like, ah. I'm like, just fucking kiss me, you hunk. God damn it. I'm paying you an Indian takeout and cheap wine. Is this not worth it? Yeah. I mean, that would do it for me. I wouldn't even take the food. I'd just be like, all right, let's just hang out. The funny thing that happened was by the time we got to issue three, uh, uh, Tiffy especially, um, she started to really um, take ownership over the character a bit, uh, in which I realized that I shouldn't give her the wine before we do the photos <laughs> because she was kind of drunk. And she kept saying, I don't think Susie would do this. I'm like, well, she is doing it because that's in the script and I need to take the photos. But I, I think Susie would do something more like this. I'm like, well, that's not what's in the script, so please don't do that. Uh, yeah, it's been a fun process. <laughs> I think, yeah, Sex Criminals was probably the first book that I picked up that like you were on personally. I actually just read the the first trade. What was it like a few weeks yeah. ago? Yeah, it was just really? a few weeks ago. Yeah. yeah, I really enjoyed it. I thought it was oh, really cool. good. Chance been trying to get me to read it for years, but anytime someone tells me like, "Oh, I think you'll really like it," I just instinctually you're like, "Yeah, yeah, right. like, yeah." You don't know my taste, yeah. but yeah. I finally did just read it, and I it was pleasant. I enjoyed it. I brought you oh, into good. Invaders, though. <laughs> yeah, that was on a whole different thing. You know? <laughs> 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 to have. Namor's eyebrows, so I was in it already. Fair, that's fair. <laughs> that was actually a book that we both like super enjoyed of yours, which was weird. I think I wasn't like expecting to like not enjoy it, but I was just like, all right, like these characters, whatever chips on this book, I'm gonna grab it. And then I was like, oh, I fucking love this book. Oh, awesome! That's that's great to hear. The the characters are a tough sell, just because the invaders are not historically a uh, best selling title um so yeah it was it was a bit of an uphill battle i'm glad we got the 12 issues out of it uh to tell the story so and i'm really glad you liked it yeah same i think i was actually kind of bummed out when it yeah like no, it finally ended we talked about it for like an hour one night yeah because we didn't know like how many issues it was going to be and we both yeah. kind of went in like blind not knowing anything about any of the characters really not having read anything about it but yeah by yeah. the end we were just like well, i kind of want a little more <laughs> Well, it's, it's probably good to <laughs> more than not wanting. Yeah. yeah. But I am, I'm happy we got 12 issues. Like, I kind of, I thought it'd be like Star-Lord where it would just end at issue six and I'd have to figure out a way to wrap it up. So I, by the time I was on issue four, I just kept emailing the editor like, how long do we have? How long do we have? He's like, oh, it's looking good, it's looking good. Um, so yeah, getting the 12 was like, phew. <laughs> I mean, I think Marvel was happy because I figured out a way to incorporate two artists on a title where they didn't have to alternate issues. Um, and Carlos was super fast, even though his stuff like, is insanely detailed, like um, he uh, hit every deadline. And, uh, and having Butch on the book to do the flashbacks, like I think really helped elevate it as well. So yeah, yeah. I hope they do like a nice big collection of it one day because I think it holds together as a book. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. No, I, I remember like just being like, okay, like the end of each issue, like what's gonna happen next? Yeah, yeah I. Uh, awesome. It took me a while to get caught back up, but then once I, because I have this problem where I just get way too many books at once, and yeah. then I like set aside a pile and don't touch them for a few months. Yeah, that's what sure. happened with Invaders. But then I, yeah, finally read it. I, I loved it. You did a very good job. Awesome. Thank you. Are you okay? I just my keys keep getting caught to this chair. This is just like real life. <laughs> Always. I have this problem every week. Okay. 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 Um, I guess since we're, you know, taking up all of your time, we could go into our, our questions from all of our friends. Yeah, go for it. I'm going to hold up your pillow as we do this. Wait. <gasps> oh, wow. I'm just delightful. And then it, you rub it and it, Yeah, it's just like you're disappear? gone and then you're there. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, somebody was just asking me the other day about like, a Chip Zdarsky body pillow, and I'm like, well, there was a pillow. 
Yeah, no, uh, my friend was very pleased that you remembered that he had done this for you. <laughs> oh yeah, no, it's, it's remarkable. I've only ever seen this. I did a signing in London, which somebody brought like a Chip Zdarsky pillow, which I had to sign, which is a weird thing. Yeah, but I'm sure only. I just, I'm just kind of used to it now, which is, that's also weird when you get used to it. Yeah. Like Sex Criminals especially was like the kind of book where people just bring you really weird stuff at shows. <laughs> like I signed and a lot of butt plugs. <laughs> Uh, crazy amount do you wonder if they've been used or do you not want to think about that i just never ask if they were <laughs> fine I, I or like afterwards them. like non-used but then they're like well now it's been signed gotta gotta My plug up is so when they hand it to me they expect me to use it and then sign it and give it back oh my gosh but most conventions frown upon such things see our biggest problem when we were coming up with questions is we felt like we didn't come up with enough like wild boys like wild questions oh yeah <laughs> the wild ones i've uh just been told that i just i get too uncomfortable sometimes so i was trying to tone it back because we've I, never met so i didn't yeah, want to make you uncomfortable <laughs> it's so easy to just like be wildly uncomfortable on zoom i find <laughs> it's not a problem at all uh, Who asked that one? You need to ask that one. Oh, <laughs> the last one? Yes. Uh, my friend Derek, he came through the drive drive through to get coffee and comics the other day, and he asked me, who do you think is better in bed, Spider-Man or Daredevil? I mean, Daredevil, the senses, obviously, uh, have him in the lead. Like he's, he's clearly a sexual dynamo, and he understands his way around the human body. Um, Spider-Man would uh, constantly be questioning what he's doing. And he would always be asking too, which, you know, normally in a sexual situation, that's great, you know, you should have an open line of communication, but at some point it's like, this is actually kind of fucking annoying. Like you should actually know by now. Like, is this okay? Is that okay? Are you okay? Is this okay? And like, I gave you one, I gave you one, it's okay. You can just keep going. If it's not okay, I'll tell you it's not okay. All right. And when he gets, the problem with Spider-Man is when, when he gets super excited, like he forgets about the, the sticky hands. And so like he'll accidentally pull parts. I was just imagining just webs being like everywhere and then yeah. partner just being like, you know what, I'm done. I don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> get out of yeah. here. Yeah, yeah, it's too much. So, yeah. That feels like a very clear answer. I don't know. I agree with you. Uh, yeah, no, I also yeah. thought it was a very clear yeah. answer, but yeah. I, I don't know why your friend even thinks that's a question, but. <laughs> the like, same what's, person. What's, what, what's the more bluish color, blue or red? <laughs> it's like that kind of a question. Okay, this is a fun one. Uh, why Garfield? <laughs> hmm, that's a great one. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know exactly why. When I was a kid, I enjoyed Garfield. And as I got older, what I appreciated about Garfield was the consistency of it. Like other comics were funnier, but sometimes those comics would miss. And Garfield never missed, but it was never really funny, right? Like it always was a solid gag, same drawings. Uh, and and I, so I appreciated that. And for some reason, when I worked at the newspaper, I, I really incorporated Garfield into as many of my columns and drawings as possible. It was like kind of my go-to gag to the point where one day I came into the newsroom and on my chair was a package. And once in a while, like a reader would send me like a fun thing. Um, and I opened the package and it was a adult Garfield costume. <laughs> and I was so excited and it was anonymous. And so I put it on the newsroom and I just started walking around showing all the reporters, this is, this is my persona, this is who I am. And at that point, like some dignitaries walked by, like <laughs> they were being interviewed at the paper by like our top reporters. And I was just like, oh my God, I'm just gonna get fired. Uh, but yeah, I love that. I love that costume so much. And, uh, and so I wore it to our, um, our sex criminals book launch. Um, so what ha we had the book launch at a sex club in Toronto. All of our friends came. It was like this huge thing. It's like a, it was like a three level sex club. And uh, Matt and I, Matt flew in. We had a, a thing planned where 
um, Matt was Matt got his nipple pierced on stage while being comforted by a local um, uh, sex worker, sex advice columnist named Sasha, uh, while I, dressed as Garfield, read erotic poetry to the room. And uh, so the photos of me doing that went everywhere. <laughs> and, and, uh, and my love of Garfield became quite known at that point. And, uh, and uh, at, at, at some stage, I think just before that, uh, a friend of mine who lived in Abu Dhabi, uh, he was working at a magazine there, and he said, uh, hey, we want to um, assign you an interview. We want you to interview Jim Davis of Garfield. I'm like, that's amazing. Why? He's like, we want to find out why Jim Davis always has Garfield send Nermal to Abu Dhabi. Because in the comic, that's what always happens. He puts Nermal in a box, writes Abu Dhabi on it, and sends Nermal away. So I'm like, this is fantastic. <laughs> so I figured out a way to contact Jim Davis, set up the interview, and, and got to talk to him for like uh, half an hour just about Garfield and Garfield's place in the world and how, how much thought is put into how that translates into other countries. Because the Abu Dhabi thing was, they knew they wanted to send Nermal somewhere. When I say they, I mean Paws Incorporated, the company that produces <laughs> Garfield. And so they had to just figure out where. And so they had a big meeting where they're just like, all right, so it's got to sound funny to English speakers. It's got to have a funny timber to it. Um, but it can't be too long because someone suggested Timbuktu and Jim Davis was like, that's not going to fit. Like there's only so much space in a Garfield comic. So they landed on Abu Dhabi because they liked the sound of it. And also there was very little chance that the U.S. was going to go to war with them which was a consideration. Like the fact that they put that kind of <laughs> thought, into, thought it. into it. I'm just like, that's amazing. Um, so anyways, yeah, so I, I had that interview with Jim Davis. I had the Garfield costume, all these things. And then uh, at some point when Sex Criminals really took off, we started getting guest artists to do covers. We were like, let's get Jim Davis. Like that would be amazing. And so uh, once again, you know, I used my contact to get in touch with Jim Davis. And uh, uh, I don't really, I don't hear anything back from him. And then when he finally responds through his publicist, he's like, he's like, he feels like he's not good enough to do a comic book cover, which is, you know, his polite way of saying, no, I'm not going to draw your sex comic. <laughs> <laughs> um, but he feels bad about it. So he's sending you a little something I'm like, oh, that's amazing. So, you know, I waited patiently. And then uh, we received a package and uh, my wife and I were in the kitchen. I'm just like, all right. And I opened it up and I opened up the package and I fell to the floor just laughing. There was a note that said, you know, that he felt bad, but he was hoping this gift would, you know, make up for that on Garfield stationery. He did a drawing of Garfield for me, like with pencil crayon and like ink um, with a, uh, with a me mask on, like he's lifted the mask. He's wearing my clothes. He's got a mask of me. That's amazing. And like, and, uh, and it was addressed to my real name, which is Steve. And, and the, on the drawing underneath it just says, um, I bet you didn't know that Garfield had a Steve costume. Oh my God. Cause I guess Sorry. what he did was like, he, he Googled me and then instantly saw me on stage in a Garfield costume is just like, oh, I know what to do. So it's 100% my me most, cry. it's my 100% my most treasured possession. It hangs proudly in our living room. Uh, I, I love it more than anything in the world. Oh, that's, I'm, I'm glad that was my question. Yeah. I, I, I'm so happy for you. Too. Yeah, no, like, I'm super happy incredible. for you too. Also, it really worked out because the, um, because I had that contact info when, mm -hmm. uh, when uh, Ryan North wanted the guest artist for Squirrel Girl, I was able to put him in touch with Jim Davis. So Jim Davis drew like uh, two pages in Squirrel Girl of like Galactus and Silver Surfer. So really in, cool. inadvertently, yeah. uh, I was able to help make that happen, which is nice. Yeah. That is awesome. Uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> I know my eyes are all watery now. I love that so much. <laughs> this is the best. <laughs> we are emotional humans. <laughs> Especially Same when it here. comes to Garfield. 
Yeah. Yeah, no, I uh, actually went, this is unrelated, but also Garfield related. I went on a scavenger hunt at a thrift store and ended up becoming obsessed with all of the McDonald's, like Garfield oh, yeah. mugs. I know the ones. Yeah, I have the one, the canoe one. Yeah. Yeah. Is that the one I was drinking? Yeah. yeah. I drank a bunch of wine from it the other night. It was fun. I, 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 well, one of the side effects of all this is that almost at every convention, somebody gives me a Garfield merch. So my house was just like full of it. I ended up getting rid of a bunch of it recently. I don't know if I have any kicking in the studio. <laughs> like things that were useful, like mugs that we would hold on to, but uh, but all the other Garfield stuff ended up going in a, a, a lawn sale to a lot of confused neighbors. Uh, okay. Another, another question from one of our friends is, are you a grower or a shower? Okay. Uh, yeah, like, I'm not going to lie. Um, I am a sh shower. Um, but it's hard to tell because of all the pubic hair. Makes it's, just, sense. It's, it's, it's just, it's like a shroud. Yeah. And it's just, it's a mess. Is it like Krakoa? Yeah, very Krakoa. <laughs> very Krakoa. We have to get the X-Men fans in here. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, no gold balls joke. <laughs> but the, um, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I would say it's a shower. It's a bit of a grower. But it's kind of, th it's kind of thin like this. <laughs> So it's weird. You're like, oh, hey, that's a bit of a grower. And you're like, oh, but it's also absolutely useless. Uh, <laughs> is it proportionate to your height? Um, I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't, yeah, I've never given that, that much thought. Yeah. Anyways. Okay. I don't know which ones we've asked already. Um, I know you kind of can't do either of these right now because they're illegal. Hmm. I say illegal. They're really not illegal. I'm sorry. Uh, do you prefer a handshake or a hug? I mean, it shows, um, again, one of the side effects of working on a book called Sex Criminals is people feel very much like they know you and that they want contact with you. So I was always open to hugs. Like people would just hug me all the time. It shows. Um, very rarely would I get handshakes. It would just be people like tackling me, hugging me, whatever. Um, I would get sick almost every show, I would say. Yeah. All right. Since we are emotional little babies, is there a comic that has made you cry? Uh, yeah, for sure. Okay, just, just one second. All right, so this is the this is the first time I ever cried reading a comic. Um, it's also the first like graphic novel I ever owned as a kid, because I think it was Marvel's first graphic novel, which is the death of Captain Marvel. Um, I didn't know anything about Captain Marvel. I barely knew anything about all the characters, but uh, I just gotta find this one panel. There's one panel in here with Star Fox, problematic character, but. Um, that I remember as a kid, like I, I remember drawing this over and over again because it was the first time I'd seen a panel sum up an emotion, if that makes sense, especially, you know, kind of early 80s. Let's see if it actually gets there. It's like, it's Star Fox just like crying, trying to hold it back as, as Captain Marvel walks away. And it's because he's fighting cancer through the whole thing, right? Um, yeah, and it's basically, yeah, it's Captain Marvel just telling Star Fox that, you know, uh, Alicia is going to need someone she can talk to, confide in, she's going to need a friend. I can't think of anyone who would be better at that than you. Will you? And he's like, of course. And that's when he starts to cry as, as he walks away. So, like, a silent panel, like, you didn't see a lot of those also in comics at the time um, because people tended to fill comics with uh, dialogue as often as they could. Um, and yeah, just it, it said so much to me, just as like a, a single panel. Um, and yeah, it's, it's a story where the hero dies at the end. Like it's, it's, it's such a wild idea. Um, 
Like this is the last panel in it. The last panel is just them saying he's gone as they put the sheet over him. That's the last panel of the book. Oh my book. gosh. Like, you know, it's all about him, like, you know, him fighting Thanos, kissing death and the heart stopping, <laughs> and, like all the classic cosmic stuff. And it's, it's yeah, it's amazing. Um, I'm an easy cry for sure. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I cry over everything. Oh, uh, yeah. It's, it's funny. Like, um, we, we've uh, got our next door neighbors watching The Leftovers. You ever watched it? I watched the first season. First season is really intense. Mm -hmm. Second season is like 10 times better. And the third season is just one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. Okay, so keep watching. Um, yeah, definitely keep watching. I've watched like half okay. the first season. Okay. It was the kind of thing where like we, we told him to watch it and then I started to watch clips to remind myself and I'd just be crying in the studio just like lunchtime watching a five minute clip and then I started like, I don't know, kind of a masochistic thing and then I started thinking about Battlestar Galactica. Did, did you guys watch that? I've watched half Battlestar Galactica. I keep like, it's one of those things where my boyfriend doesn't really like sci-fi shows. So it's I have to barely sci-fi. It's like political. Like yeah, it's but he's he just can't do it. He can't handle yeah. it. He can't pay attention. There's a there's a scene in the final episode. I won't spoil anything for you. That's just gut wrenching. Just gut wrenching and beautiful. And I was like, again, like it was like yesterday. I'm just like, I'm just gonna watch that scene. And I'm just like, I'm a mess. I'm just falling apart. <laughs> Constantly falling apart. Yeah, yeah. I'm 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 an easy touch for that stuff. Uh, to the point where okay. <laughs> When I worked at the newspaper, um, I realized that I, I actually avoided sad movies. Like, I just avoid them because I know how I react. And so I pitched a column at the paper in the movie section called The Tear Jerk, uh, in which I went back and watched all the sad movies and rated them on a, a tier scale, like four tiers out of five. <laughs> and uh, my, my, my wife... Um, She's uh, not as sentimental as I am. And so uh, she had the unfortunate burden of going with me to movies during that period <laughs> in which I would just be a blubbering mess. I'd <laughs> have to reach into like a bag and pull out a Kleenex. Like they're terrible movies too. Like uh, I'd walk out of a, the time traveler's wife or whatever, just like a mess. And she'd be like, this is such a bad movie. How are you crying? I'm like, cause it's, it, it's sad. It's so Put yourself bad. in their shoes. <laughs> the worst one was um, uh, a friend of mine uh, took me to a film festival screening of a movie called Quill. And it's not the S&M one with Jeffrey Rush <laughs> about the Marquis de Sade. It was a uh, fictionalized depiction of uh, real events in uh, Tokyo when they introduced seeing eye dogs there. So it was about like a, a basically a bad seeing eye dog and its new uh, master, uh, this blind man, this grumpy blind man, as they kind of learn to get along. Uh, spoiler, uh, towards the end of the movie, the master dies. And so the dog, <laughs> I'm going to barely be able to <laughs> The dog was a scene, the dog at the funeral going up to the casket to say goodbye to his master. And like, I'm, I'm dying, I'm crying so much uh, uh, watching this. But because it's a, a film festival screening, there's a, a blind people in the audience with their seeing eye dogs. All the dogs start howling at this scene. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> like, I'm not even shitting you. I'm like, it's just, it was like one of the weirdest and most moving things that I think I've ever experienced. And, uh, and it gets worse because the end of the movie, uh, the dog lives to a ripe old age, retires as a seeing eye dog, goes live with this couple who has like retired dogs. Like it's just their thing. And it's like, <laughs> it's a scene where the dog's just like being called for supper and the dog's lumbering along and it's going down a step and it trips and it falls <laughs> and it breaks its hip. It's just like, like it's just gratuitous. And, uh, and so it's all about the dogs like last moments when they have to let them go. And, like, oh. and so we left that uh, theater. We start walking down the street. My friend goes, she goes, uh, 
I think the saddest part was when the master died and I just started falling <laughs> the street. She had to pull me into an alley and just like gently stroke my hair for like half an hour. Um, so yeah, so I, I, uh, I, that's to say I'm an easy touch for this stuff. And um, I wrote that column for about a year uh, until I, I just, I couldn't take it anymore. Like my heart couldn't take it anymore <laughs> seeing all these sad movies. Yeah. Uh, that, that brings me like not joy, but like it makes me feel better that like other people are just as emotional. Yeah. 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 Cause sometimes I'm like, am I just like out of control right now? Yeah. I always feel like that. I live in a house with three men who just don't know how to talk about their feelings. So anytime we watch those kind of movies, I'm sobbing and they're just like, what is wrong with you? <laughs> like, what are you doing? I'm like, I just have feelings. <laughs> feelings. Yeah. In, in my comics, I, I think it's harder to do in comics because you have less control over 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 the audience like with with a, with a movie like there's so much happening in a performance with a comic because it's still it's very hard to kind of like really tap into emotion i think um i think out of all the comics i've done the only one where there's a scene which kind of made me tear up writing it was the end of spider-man life story I don't know if you have you read that one. Yeah, I have. <laughs> Champ Dickens. Yeah, yeah. So like like the the final scene in Peter's head with him and MJ, and then explaining the dream and ending with that shot was like partly because like the whole project was uh, such a massive undertaking, and knowing that that was the final bit. Like so, when I'm typing it up, I'm like the end right after it. Like I was just like, oh, okay. Like that's that's what you get for building up to <laughs> a giant. <laughs> sad scene over six issues and thousands of hours of work um yeah it's actually one of my favorite books to also sell to people yeah mom. i sold that to people based off of what you told me so. <laughs> <laughs> it's a it's a tricky one because like I, I i don't know how it reads to somebody if it's like their first spider-man experience because it is so much about like twisting all the the lore and stuff yeah, um, it was like an exercise more than anything, like the way we constructed that book. So I, I, it was hard to tell as I was writing it if it held together as a proper narrative. Um, but but I, but I feel strongly that the, the last issue does, um, which kind of makes up for the previous issues. Maybe I, say, not. I think it, the last issue definitely does a great job of just like tying it together. Yeah, yeah, hopefully. <laughs> and, you know, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh so i guess i guess the last thing we have for you is a a poem we did not write it yeah we did not write this this is from our friend Mm. this is the most ridiculous thing so it's called ode to chip Mm. okay i can pronounce that you can do it how do i love daddy let me count the ways. Wait, math isn't my strong suit. I read comics because novels give me a headache. Anyway, anyhow, here we go. Skin like still warm, freshly churned butter, piercing hazel eyes that betray a well of sadness, and a sous-song of fatigue <laughs> from it. replying to thirsty replies. Or DMs. <laughs> uh, such tousled hair and scruffy beard, the marks of a master craftsman dedicated to art more than health, and again, replying to mad thirsty DMs. Soft, lilting voice, soothing, revivifying, like a spring breeze. They have that in Canada, right? Spring? (laughs) A cock of the brow, a turn of the lip, and words transform wisdom into wit. (laughs) Wow. This is my exact reaction when I was reading it in my head. Mix these up, combine them, and you get simply un. Im, I can't pronounce that word. Uninhibited. <laughs> How did I not see that word before? Uninhibitably, Zdarsky. Or if you fucked up the directions, a Lovecraftian shoggoth monstrosity of teeth and eyes and two mesent tentacles. Jesus Christ, read the instructions through once before attempting to make a chip. <laughs> wow. Dearest chip. Your bum may be banned from Twitter, but will never be banished from my heart. Aww. Or the scrapbook I keep hidden from my partner behind the false brick in the fireplace. 
Also, he works on really good comics. I particularly like Sex Criminals and the issue where Jonah makes Spidey lasagna. Lasagna. Who would have figured Jameson for an Italian comfort food guy? Chip. The answer is Chip. That's who. And this is from wow. our uh, triple dip dipper, chip dipper. Triple chip dipper. Harvey man friend Jenston. Wow, that's amazing. That, that, that's, that, that shall rest on the mantle of my mind next to the Jim Davis drawing of me. I can send you a photo of it if you need it. For I, I, would, I would love it actually, <laughs> yeah, please do. <laughs> Yeah, he was, he's very pleased with this. Yeah, so. he is very pleased so with he, this. He should be. It's master, <laughs> masterfully written. His, I'm a huge fan of the subject. <laughs> His partner is now worried, but hmm. we figure, you know, you know what? It's, it's, it's nice. Okay. It's nice to introduce that just slight element of worry in a relationship, I think. It keeps things spicy. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, I will say the thirsty DMs, my DMs are very much closed. I had them open just for that brief window for the podcast requests. And as soon as the weird ones came in, I was like, we're shutting this down. <laughs> I can't imagine. Yeah, that's uh, whatever. I mean, I was just nervous just saying like, hey, can we like interview you? Like, I can't imagine being like, hey, can I do something gross and dirty to you? <laughs> can I be just way too personal for someone that I just don't know? Let's get real gross. Like, I don't, I, it's not like I even mind it. Like, I don't know, I've been doing comics and weird sex stuff for uh, for a long time now. And, you know, people will be very frank and upfront in whichever way they can contact me. And I, I'm, I'm fine with it because I don't have like, there's no, uh, uh, I have no underlying issues with it at all. And if it brings them joy to um, say weird sex stuff to me, like, it's, it's fine, it's fine. like. I don't have a history of being demeaned uh, in society, so or objectified. So it's like, yeah, sure, all right. Yeah. <laughs> um, I just can't um, participate because then it gets weird. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think that's all we have. Yeah, that's it. That's yeah. it. Well, you really ended on a high note there with that poem. That's yeah. That's what we were going for. Yeah. We were hoping to make you cry, but you know, there's a little bit. There's a little bit. I was saying we almost did it. A little. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I saw it. Yeah. 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 For sure. I think that might be from Quill, though. <laughs> oh, Quill. Oh. oh my God. Uh, next creator. If we ever do this again, we'll have to try to make them cry too. Yeah, <laughs> that's pretty good. It was um. What was there? It was a Comedy Central show where um, it's two people facing off trying to cry. Like whoever cries first wins. Oh my god! It's very good. It's very good. Do you think you would cry first, or do you think I would? I cry um, over literally everything, especially when it has to do with dogs. I so I was in a movie years ago, and um, one of the scenes required. It was supposed to be like a day after uh, I broke up with somebody and I was supposed to look like I'd been crying. And, uh, and yeah, it was relatively easy to kind of like to tap into it. Like you just got to kind of got to sit there and think about dogs, basically. That's... Like dogs you have known and loved. Yeah. And, and, and it just turns on like that. Yeah. I think, I think they were surprised that I was able to do it too because it was like none of us were really actors in it. It was like kind of this weird mumblecore movie. <laughs> um, that ended up in a film festival, so I was quite proud. But uh, and on Air Canada, people could watch it when they were <laughs> flying across Canada, which was like so wild. I love the fact that I was in a movie that people could watch while they like. eat bad food. <laughs> Do uh, they still show it? No, 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 no. It's been years. It was great because, like, the deal, like when Air Canada bought it, like basically paid for the production of the movie, so like, everyone was quite happy. That's pretty uh, cool. But yeah, I was I was very proud that I could make myself cry. That's my trick too. I just think about dogs. Yeah. Or the dodo. That channel, the on like Facebookers, I don't know if it's just Facebook, but it's just animals who are like in bad situations who are rescued, rehabilitated. And oh, yeah, yeah. Find their homes or whatever. When they get like limbs and they're mm. like 
yeah. have an agreed forget time. It. Yeah, yeah. Forget it. <laughs> I'm done with it. I can't do it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> All right. All right. I got to right. go make some sort of cauliflower dinner. So wish me luck. Good luck, Chip. Thank yes, you for talking luck. to us. Seriously. Yeah, thanks for this. This was great. Yeah. I had a fun time and I will tell everyone about you. <laughs> yes. <finally. laughs> send, send any other creators you want to cry our way. We'll All make right. We'll do. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. They'll love that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thanks Thank a lot. You guys. All right. That was wonderful. Have a good evening. You, you too. too. All right.